So, good evening. Evening. Why evening? I uh, yes, unfortunately I'm I'm the one who wants to uh, always make our listeners know that we are filming either in the uh, in the morning or in the evening, usually in the evening. And one reason being the the thing that uh we are at home, and the other is that uh, I look like a vampire, more or less. I think I you're think being kind suit. to yourself. Uh, yes. Uh, the, the, uh, the years have been kind, kind to me. Yes, they have. Yes, yes they so, have. So, <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> so, um, what I'm going, to, I'm going to call today is, today's episode is going to be about gaming. Uh, we had the fortune, the fortune, to host a gaming conference here in Zagreb. Uh, it was a game jam that enabled young people to actually show what they what they can do in the gaming, and we had the immense pleasure of hosting John Romero. So we prepared for the uh, last part of the show. We prepared a small uh, interview with John. But before that, let's roll the intro and talk a little bit about the gaming education. Okay. So, Vedran. What do you think about uh, gaming and the state it is today? I am almost illiterate gamer in terms of what's popular right now. What has been popular for the past many, many years, the reason being a decision that I think we can uh, also comment on uh, a little bit later. Um, I was thinking that we are going to do a little bit of sharing in terms of uh, some of the games that may be formed our, let's say, gaming experiences from early age onwards, or maybe from a certain point in life. Uh, and after that, uh, I think that your gaming life is going to be much, much more rich than mine. And there's uh, a fundamental reason for that, because for the most part, I, at a certain point in life, I just completely stopped gaming. So I think that uh, as, as much as I like your... Uh, intro to my uh, to let's say my lack of knowledge of today's gaming and me knowing about gaming only from the stuff that I read in the papers and I don't do that very often I think that the, the star of today's show is going to be more you than me because you are much more in tune with the gaming as it is today partially because of the side job that you do with one of your uh, clients and partially because you are just generally speaking more informed and more involved in gaming as a person but, uh, okay, I'm going to buy into this and I'm just going to say that I was expecting something else mm -hmm. because uh, gaming today is such a huge thing that I, w I, would, I was expecting more, the answer more in the lines of uh, how the gaming today is basically too big for you and you are not completely into it just because of the sheer size of the in uh, industry. I don't think it's that. Uh, uh, because what I... Uh, I'm looking at the gaming partially from inside. And that inside thing is because I work for a, a Crow team and Crow team is one of the, and is the oldest uh, company that makes games in Croatia, but is also one of the major indie uh, companies that create games uh, on a world scale. And the thing that I have learned doing business with them is that A, I'm not a gamer, I'm just a DevOps guy there uh, making sure that the things work. And the other thing is that uh, games are so immensely huge industry that you cannot uh, state that you are a gamer unless you are actually uh, involved, uh, uh, waste, I'm going to go into waste, uh, investing a lot of time into uh, <laughs> playing different games, seeing different genres, and the same different things. Because Today's, uh, today, when people t uh, say uh, somebody is a gamer, they usually mean that he uh, uh, plays a single game or a couple of games uh, all the time. I don't know. Something on the console, something on the PC, whatever. And the I think that the breadth or the uh, how the industry is big is something that is completely escaping the people. 
the number of games that are released uh, every day is uh, in hundreds. Uh, the number of good games is also in thousands uh, every year. It is uh, whatever is is your uh, notion poison of no poison of choice. Uh, you can play uh, real-time strategies. You can play uh, horror games. You can cl- play uh, play uh, shooters. You can play puzzlers. You can play the whole slew of different games, and there is a huge, huge selection of games that are uh, released uh, every day, that are simply great. Mm-hmm. And this is one of the things that is uh, I wouldn't say bothering me. That is a, a, a nice thing to have, but at the same time. Uh, every time when I'm approaching gaming, I know that if from inside it's even bigger. Mm-hmm. So when you take a look at what is being released, and when you know some of the developers, and you know how many games they have stashed as uh, prototypes, projects, and ideas, suddenly you realize that you are not only going to not only going to be able to play all the games, you're not even scratching the top of it. It's this, almost the same as with books or with uh, TV or with movies. Once you get into it, you will suddenly realize that it's too big. There is so much uh, content out there that you cannot uh, follow it all. And you cannot, uh, 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 even if you try, you cannot just uh, test everything that, is, uh, that is, has been released. Okay. Can I sum up... Uh let's say my gaming experience in the past 20 years okay because it's a super short history literally from 2003 until today or 2004 until today there are free games that are played uh, that is uh, two games on nintendo uh, v and switch the same game mario kart which i played in hundreds and hundreds of hours and I played Legion at Larry on PlayStation 3. That's it. I haven't played a thing on PC since way before 2003, actually. Uh, and I've, I've stopped for a reason. Uh, and the, the fact that I played these three games is odd for me. But at the same time, the fact that I played Mario Kart on two different platforms, and I still play that to this very day. I played it... Uh, let's say two weeks ago over the weekend and I played it over the the Christmas, New Year's Eve vacations that we have. Um, My partner and I played it for many, many hours. But the reason that I can play that is because A, it's fun. Uh, It's uh, like a, let's say, group activity because that's what Switch is uh, for me and Nintendo uh, Wii, the, the original white one. Uh, so it's meant to be played by multiple people. It lacks certain things that most PC games have in twen- uh, in the past 20 years, which is it doesn't have an awful lot of uh, graphical burden. So it's rather rudimentary in terms of the graphics. It's more focused on the simple gameplay and being fun. Uh, so those things are actually uh, something that resonates with me for the past 20 years. Uh, Pleasure Suit Larry that I played on, on PlayStation was just a gimmick because they haven't played that for many years. Basically, it's like talking about Prince of Persia on PC 30-plus years ago. That's that's what the LSL for me is, because that's one of the first games that I played. Uh, having said that, uh, just to kind of like give, get it out in the open, I start, stopped playing around the time, uh, or let's, let's put it this way, uh, right after the original boom of some of the adventures kind of like blowed off, uh, and the last game that I played, and I played that one super heavily, was Dune 2000. Okay, I'm 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 with you because um, actually I Dune, active... Dune one, Dune two, and then Dune 2000, and after 2003, I only played Dune once, and that was for five days straight when I was doing a course uh, for our present company. Believe it or not, yeah, I, I remember okay. that now, but. Uh, but outside of that, I haven't played a single game. And actually, I just d- described to you the reason why I stopped gaming, because I don't know how to stop. Uh, but I think that today you would know how to stop. Because uh, when it comes to games, it's not only that there is an enormous amount of game uh, games available, there is also enormous amount of crap available on the, on the market. Okay. So... Uh, uh, 
the uh, good titles are extremely good. But also you can see so many bad games that uh, even if you try actively playing, unless you commit yourself to a single game, as some people do, and I must say that I also played Dune 2000 and I didn't like it as much as, for, uh, for example, Command and Conquer. Okay, played that but, one heavily but, as well. Yes, but when I played that one, I committed. I committed to Civilization. Mm -hmm. But the last time I committed to a game uh, in, de uh, by, in that intensity, in that spirit that I wouldn't sleep for a day or for a night in order to play a play game, it was probably 20 years ago. I am actively right now trying to play some games mm -hmm. and I am uh, finding it hard to uh, play the games usually more than an hour or even less. Okay. Um, it just isn't that, uh, depending on the game, of course, but it just isn't so attractive when it comes to the games, to the games because I think that most of them, uh, first, lack the uh, drive that you need to, do, to uh, play them, mm -hmm. simply be because they are uh, trying to overachieve. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is that it's hard to find a game that fits me uh, because I know that there is so much things out there. So basically, you just uh, play the game, play it for the first 15 minutes, and then realize, okay, I like, I don't know, 80% of this game, but the 20% is bothering me, so I'm going to try to find another one. Okay. And, and the other thing is that, uh, believe it or not, uh, today's games are starting to run uh, a full, full circle. What they're doing is that they are um, a big thing among, among gamers or among gaming design is uh, games that are more or less uh, low poly, so low, uh, low polygon, low polygon count. And this means that they, I wouldn't say they look ugly, but they look simplistic and they look uh, different than what you would uh, expect the game to look, like, to look like. Now you are playing my tune. That's what I like. So and this is the this is one of those things. Uh, we are slowly, slowly moving towards uh, games uh, trying to be fun mm -hmm. and trying to be uh, uncomplicated, but also having the physics, having the ideas, having the things that you need inside a good game, mm -hmm. because now it's uh, they're capable of doing it, and they uh, some of the games stopped wasting time on trying to create. Uh, basically uh, uh, alternate reality. So hyper-reality games are not in. Uh, people don't like hyper-reality games anymore. It's, uh, I'm for me, it's not only that, if I can just interrupt you for a second. For me, I am, uh, I am a person who mostly likes to commit to a game. So that's the first thing. You, I mean, that's obvious because I had huge problems with you know gaming when both of us were in college and literal, real, like crazy problems and uh, after that uh, I also realized that I have to control that hence the reason why I haven't played but more to the point most of the games that came out after after Dune 2000 and Common and Conquer for me are just boring as hell I don't like our uh, first person shooters I don't like war games I don't like any of that crap uh, my for me as a person the strategy uh, strategy based approach of Dune and Co Common and Conquer is where my gaming, let's say, uh, attention and focus was, is, and always will be. I'm going to just go into my Steam account and just uh, check on what are the games that I, ca that I currently played in the last six, uh, six months or so. I have and no this... Steam account. Okay, I have more than 300 games in my Steam account. Uh, so... Apart from the games that I play with my uh, kid, uh, things like, uh, okay, uh, Lego, Marvel, whatever, uh, Farming Simulator, because for some reason as a young kid he loves tractors, mm -hmm. and this is, uh, this is uh, obviously a thing, <laughs> so it has to be done, and it's much cheaper to buy um, uh, virtual tractors than the real ones in the, in the plastic ones. Oh, really? And so this is one of those things. Uh, I'm going to say the first game that I liked a lot was something called Bitburner. Uh, and this is the game that probably you either hate or love uh, because the idea of the game is that you have to uh, create JavaScript. Mm -hmm. uh, 
uh, you are scripting yourself into the game. So the game is a sort of uh, hacking uh, programming game where you have to create scripts in order to automate things. Heart pass. Okay. Then the next thing would be probably uh, transport fever, where you create, of course, uh, trains and uh, boats and uh, the infrastructure to push things from one to one, one place to the other. Shenzhen IO, which is also a programming game but in assembly, mm -hmm. it has a simplified assembly in it, and it's it's a lot of fun if you are into IT. Uh, then Battle Beat Remastered, which is a low poly shooter uh, capable of uh, 128 against 128 players per session on a single server. Mm -hmm. So it's an amazingly fast uh, shooter. And that's it, other than uh, something called Rail Route. And this is also a planning game where you just simply you have a, a fixed. Uh, train station or train depot with different tracks and you have to automate them and make the trains run on time i think that that's your uh steam library described uh in terms of one fiftieth of how much how many games you have but also your rose personality comes out of that trains trains stations trains trains Yes, but the, the idea is that uh, my biggest problem is that uh, once upon a time, uh, a couple of years ago, I decided to uh, get a subscription for Humble Bundles. Mm -hmm. So I get a lot of games from them and uh, I simply just uh, install them, try them out and then more or less either forget them or delete them. And this is just the thing. And, this is the, and the thing is that a lot of games are just like that for me. By a lot, I mean almost all of them. Okay. And I am, uh, since I don't have the time, I like to do things that are not gaming. I would much prefer to play with, uh, I don't know, AI and create a book or try to create a book than to play a game. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's just one of those things where you just, I don't know, either am I, I'm too old or just my creative um, self is uh, not ready to commit hours because I feel like I'm wasting time that I could have wasted on something more creative. Okay. Yeah. Um, I mean, t just like you, I started the era of the early, you know, uh, 18, 8 or 16-bit computers. My first computer was an Amstrad CPC 464. And I did get a lot of mileage out of that. But I was way, that was way earlier in life. I was in primary school. And yes, you had, you had time. Yeah, exactly that. Back then, I had some time because uh, I was already heavily into sports and I was in, you know, primary musical school. So I didn't have all that much time as as you might think, but still more than today, of course. That's that goes. Okay, but this saying. is this is a different thing. Different. This is different uh, kind of time because uh, today you are also more more inclined to do something creative, mm -hmm. and you are trying to make your time count. Mm -hmm. When you're a kid, you go from place to place where you have to be. So for, for sports, uh, music school, uh, the school itself and so on. But then you have some downtime that you are ready to waste on uh, anything that can be game related. And this is normal. Now, as I said, the games are more of a job to me mm -hmm. because I'm much, uh, I'm much uh, closer to the uh, industry part of it. I know how the games are made so... It's almost the same thing as with uh, sausages. And once you see how the sausage is made, you wouldn't probably eat it. <laughs> so this is one of those things. And I also uh, have the opportunity to talk to people who are making games. And I'm going to say that I got so much uh, experience, better experience out of meeting uh, Jean Romero during the last couple of days and talking to different people around the uh, event that we uh, hosted than uh, that I would get from playing games. Speaking of which, uh, uh, we need to go into that, but first we need to go backwards a little bit. Do you have anything else to add before we start with that part of the story? Because, I mean, we are in no rush. We can stretch this. No, no, no. I just want to, I just want to go on with the story because there are a couple of points that I want to make before we introduce John and uh, the short interview that I did. Because I was trying to make some points, and the points I was trying to make was... Uh, okay, let's start from the start. 
uh, the event that we were trying to uh, that we were trying that we created or that we uh, uh, helped organize yeah, that's was much the better. event that was that was um, uh, meant to be something called the game jam. Mm-hmm. So the idea is basically that uh, you are given as a team. Uh, it's mainly intended for the developing teams. They're given a theme, and then they need to create a game out of the theme. And this, uh, they have, I think, three days, three whole days to work on the game. Mm-hmm. For some reason or the other, this is the only industry that always makes sure that uh, the deadlines are 72 straight hours, 24 straight hours, 48 straight hours. And I haven't seen that in the other industries. No, For some reason, they think that people who are programming and who are creating games don't need to sleep. But, okay, it's just uh, the old me talking. I would be happy to do it uh, if I were much older, much younger. Uh on the other hand, uh, it was amazing to see young people uh, creating games. It was also amazing to see young people being interested in Doom. That was because, spectacularly interesting to me. Uh, it was it was interesting to see people who you wouldn't expect to be interested in Doom coming out uh, shaking after they met John Romero, uh, simply because they talked to him. So... Uh, we had a colleague of ours say that uh, they, uh, he, uh, he doesn't know who John Romero is. And I think that he still doesn't know who John Romero is, but the people who need to know, know. And this is one of those things where I'm completely uh, against any advertising, trying to make people believe in uh, whatever. I'm just going to say that if you are into gaming, you need to know which people are also uh, in the same uh, in the same industry with you. And then if you're dealing with them, you have to um, know how to talk to them and you have to have the opportunity to meet them. Because uh, meeting him in person uh, created an entirely different vision of how games are made for me. Mm-hmm. And... The thing that I liked in the last three or four days, that uh, which were exhausting, by the way, uh, is that uh, the feedback and the good energy came not only from him but also from everybody involved. Uh, I think that was this was uh, one of the least nonsense uh, presentations, at least nonsense uh, uh, conference days that I have seen in the last couple of probably tens tens of years. Mm-hmm. Uh, you could actually go. Uh, you could actually go to the uh, conference. Uh, you could actually talk to the people. The people that were there were actual developers with a lot of uh, experience behind them, and the uh, keynote was amazing. The atmosphere was amazing. And people were talking to each other and trying to create something new. And this was one of those positive things. I, I must say that I wasn't expecting that this is going to be so positive. Me neither. Same thing. I wanted to ask you a question related to, to John and Doom and something. Maybe we can exchange experiences because we never talked about this. Uh, not at least to my knowledge. Uh, how invested were you in, into playing Doom? Uh, I played through it in a weekend. Okay. Uh, starting from a Friday afternoon and then ending something somewhere on Saturday, Sunday. Mm-hmm. Uh, as I said, I'm not into things that last seventy two hours, but I play Doom for something like sixty hours straight, and then I went to sleep. Mm-hmm. And I must say that I haven't revisited Doom too much. Uh, I am, I was hooked on Doom because Doom was something that was new, but. Uh, I have a thing with games. Once I finish a game, for some reason or the other, I'm probably the least uh, probable person to go and play it uh, from the start. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to repeat the game. I want to see what's inside it. And uh, once I got older, with all the older games, uh, with all the newer games, sorry, uh, I usually play on the lowest uh, difficulty level because I know that I don't have the necessary tens of hours to perfect my game, I want to see the story. So 
I'm approaching most of the games as the stories. Mm -hmm. So I want to see what the game looks like, what the game is trying to tell me, but I'm not going to go and uh, waste time retrying a single level for uh, half uh, for a couple of hours. So this is the same with Doom. I went through the Doom. I chose shows probably normal difficulty or whatever. And then once I was finished with it, that was it. I wasn't uh, making something special out of it. I know it was a special game because it created the entire genre of uh, FPS shooters. But on the other hand, I think it was the execution was nice, the game was nice, but it didn't have such a replay value as it has for some some people. I'm I'm just not into replaying the games. Okay, um, because my experience was different, way different. Um, so I signed in for uh, our college in 1995, which was a couple of years after you. And uh, Doom was released in 93, if I remember correctly. So we started playing it in our labs a little bit. Uh, then I started playing it at home after I got my 486, I think, or something like that. And after that, uh, Doom became a thing that we started playing in multiplayer, and we did have a couple of events on our college for that, and I was a part of that too. So I was playing that quite heavily. But soon enough, I realized that, uh, you know, even with the cheat codes and even with everything else, it's just not that interesting to me, to FPSs in general or whatever, you know, th those types of games were not interesting to me. Uh, after that, one of my uh, one of my friends from uh, the the neighborhood brought me Dune One. Tried that; that was much more to my liking. And after that, it was Dune Two, Dune Two Thousand, and that's where my history basically ended. I did play some other games in between. Uh, majorly, I played, as I mentioned in some of the previous episodes, Full Throttle, which I still consider to be one of the best games ever made. And that was a very, very, very interesting game to me, and still is today. Uh, hence the reason why I need to, uh, you know, install some stuff on my retro PC that I that I assembled a year ago. But that being said, going back to the Doom topic, yeah, I played that one heavily for a couple of months and then just started with the Dunes, and that's where uh, where the road took me. And after that, I played that for years and years and uh, realized that I have a problem and then stopped. So yes, my the, my the Doom experience is... is different than yours, definitely. I'm going to I'm going to say that this is not the only thing that I wanted to uh, wanted to mention. The other thing was that the a game that I played the most when it comes to FPSs uh, was Counter Strike, mm -hmm. and it wasn't uh, I didn't play it uh, in single player mode because I uh, like to go and we did a lot of weekends uh, with a couple of uh, colleagues from set. Mm -hmm. uh, we did a lot of weekends where we got our computers uh, to somebody's house and played. I think the most that we did was something like 16 players in a game. Uh, and you must realize that this was, this was back in time when we had CRTs. Mm -hmm. So 16 people had to... Uh, uh, move their entire gaming rig somewhere. Old school land parties, that's where it's at. Yes, and you had to create enough space for 16 people to create uh, create their desktops and everything else and plug them in and so on. But this was uh, the most fun I got out of FPSs. Uh, first person shooters are uh, a thing for me when I play against people uh, that I know. Uh, I'm not the guy who plays multiplayer in the, uh, on the internet. And for some reason... Although I'm able to uh, talk to uh, people and uh, create a relationship with people in the real life, uh, I suck at creating a relationship in the, the games. I know a lot of people who, are, who met interesting people and are good uh, friends with them, and they met them through different uh, multiplayer games, and I'm just sim simply not one of them. That's just weird, hearing that from you, because you are very active on... Uh early social networks, uh, you know, back, yes, back in the day, I, and you met quite a few people there, and that's a part of what got you into set, probably, you know, into, into the student club, but the, the hearing that from you, that in games you didn't do that, that's weird. I, I never uh, actually met anybody on the online gaming, from the online gaming community, sim community simply because I absolutely never played online. 
But I played online, but the thing the thing was that, um, as I said, I wasn't uh, ready to commit time. Mm-hmm. And the online communities, the things that uh, you need to do and the amount of time you need to do, to, do, to, uh, to lose, to create yourself as the start of the thing, is something that uh, I wasn't ready to do. And out of this came the uh, realization or basically the result that I'm, I don't have people who I played with, that usually use, is somebody when you're talking to gamers, they have a special someone from whatever that they only met online and they were playing, I don't know, a couple of hundred hours uh, online with. I don't have any of those people. Mm-hmm. I, I just wasn't the, the person who was playing multiplayer games in, the, in that way. Okay. Uh, I pretty and I liked uh, playing games with the people I I knew uh, from real life, uh, locally, and this is the strange thing we had a network set up in the late nineties, uh, start of the two uh, thousands, using wireless and uh, I would say not strictly completely legal installations uh, across the entire uh, city. We were able to play the games. Mm-hmm. And we didn't play the games. Mm-hmm. So uh, when we wanted to create a LAN party, we would uh, go to, to a single place and create a LAN party there. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it was just a social thing. It wasn't that we wanted to play games. We wanted to meet. And the social part was also part of it. So I wouldn't say that Doom or uh, Counter-Strike or any of the other games uh, back in the days made too much sense for me uh, as a way of meeting people. I wasn't hooked up to replay the games. So this creates um, a thing that for me that I'm just, I don't have that ne- necessary, um, let's call it addiction to games. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm um, less inclined to get addicted to any of the games unless that games is civilization. I yeah, think that just like me, that for me, it's it's Dune or Full Throttle or even Tetris was very highly addictive to me. I got I got uh, Civilization installed a couple of years ago, and then I uh, installed it sometime. Let, let's let's call it like, like 10, 10 o'clock in the evening, and I said, okay, I'm going to get it inst- because it was on a, on a, a discount, and I got uh, I don't know Civilization Four or whatever, uh, and. Uh, what happened was that I realized that it was four o'clock in the morning uh, after, I don't know, six turns of the game. Mm-hmm. And then I just turned it off and didn't go back. Mm-hmm. Because I realized that I'm not going to be able to control it and I don't have the time to do it. I simply now don't have the time to do it. I want to be with my kid. I want to be with people around me. Uh, I would pretty much like to go uh, for a copy with you than to play a game at home. Agreed. Uh, and and this is one of those things. Um, but at the same time, uh, people who create games amaze me. Yeah, same. Because I so much like the optimism, the enthusiasm, the idea that they are going to create something new, although 97% of the game completely fail. And uh, when it comes to the, when you see uh, the results on the Steam, it's so difficult to uh, make a living out of creating games. Can I interject yes. with a word of wisdom for you? Or a oh, or no. word of lack of wisdom, whatever you want to call it. Oh, so the Oracle, yes? Yeah, the Oracle, right. We are not in Mat- Matrix movie. What you like is the, the child part of the story. That's it. Uh, probably, yes. And that's, probably, yes. That's awesome. And this is this is the thing. Uh, I uh, am uh, impressed with people who are able to create games. I was uh, I wasn't a big fan of uh, John when uh, he came to Zagreb, because I was fan of his work. Mm-hmm. But I wasn't such a big fan. Mm-hmm. But after I met him, yeah, that's changed. I'm now I'm now a fan because uh, he's such an enormously nice open intelligent guy who uh, does his job well who knows what he's doing and who has the work ethics of somebody who is completely out of this world yeah you know what impressed me most if i can 
kind of like give a sneak peek into some of the stuff that uh, we're going to publish, although on our um, university's uh, YouTube channel uh, in the next couple of weeks. The most uh, interesting part of these, those two days that he was with us was actually his keynote in the part that where he openly, completely, without any hesitation, talked about both his successes and failures. Yes, and he talked about problems in his life, and he talked about, basically, he created a structure out of his uh, character uh, by trying to explain why some things happened and why some things, uh, why he did some things. Uh, he omitted a couple of things, probably. But the thing was that uh, I haven't seen an interesting lecture in a while. Not uh, live. Mm -hmm. I have seen internet lectures uh, online, but I haven't seen that interesting uh, lecture in a while because we usually don't get interesting lectures here. You were basically, uh, as, as that lecture was happening, because we were, uh, we were in the director's booth in the back end doing audio and video for the conference, you were basically catatonic. I tried to contact you, but you were out. You were completely uh, into the story. Yes, I was in the story because there was a story. Yeah, yeah, I agree completely with you. And what I was and hearing in my headphones or publicly on the PA as I exited the booth, uh, I was exactly the same. And this was this is one of those things that uh, that I like. I just think that the problem is uh, with today's world that we forgot that that this, that there is is a thing called the storytelling, mm -hmm. and uh, people are doing lectures. He created a story yeah he wasn't doing just a lecture because it was a lecture but the lecture was a story he created a story uh, that had a start had a finish he defined some things and then then he finished with the what is the future of games i love the self-deprecating humor that he was using that's that's what both of us do in in our lectures as well and that's so good no no he's a good public speaker but the other thing was that uh I'm I'm not I'm not just in, I'm, uh, it's not only that I'm impressed with him I'm also impressed with all the different uh, guys who are doing the games for the last 40 years because uh, I have a couple I know a couple of those in Crow Team because Crow Team has celebrated 30 years uh, this year on last year sorry um, it takes a lot of and I mean a lot of patience to be uh, uh, to create the games for that long for the because it, 30 years, yeah, and 1993, to, yeah, it was 30, uh, Doom 30 anniversary last year as well. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes, this is the reason. But the thing was that it takes a lot of uh, dedication and hard work to do it for 30 years because, uh, as they say, uh, now it's uh, somebody was talking about uh, how much time they're going to uh, have before they uh, are going to go to, uh, to retirement. And they say at, uh, something like four projects. Mm hmm Basically, a project is a couple of years. Mm -hmm. So uh, it it takes a lot of uh, dedication to work on something for two or three years and then to have it flop. Mm -hmm. And this is the reason why uh, John said that he's doing doing the doing at least two games at a time, uh, that a couple of guys that uh, from Crow Team said that they are going doing a couple of games at a time. I know that a couple of guys from Crow Team are actually creating their own games, not only one, but two games at the time at home uh, together with the game that they're creating in the company. So this is just the thing that is different when it comes to gaming. I cannot uh, uh, imagine somebody working in, I don't know, marketing, uh, creating another business plan or another... Marketing uh, strategy. <laughs> marketing strategy for different projects <laughs> while at home. Yeah, yeah. Actually, uh, to the point, we have to get the guys from Croatim on our podcast as well. No, I don't see that this is going to be a problem. Yeah, we need to have a chat with them and the big one, or or multiple big ones. They're a very interesting bunch of characters, especially when we were having uh, our brunch, lunch, dinner, something with them. And, and John, it was an enjoyable sight to see a bunch of geeks geeking out without uh, without any reservation. Yes, but uh, you would need to create an uh, environment for them. Mm -hmm. Because it takes a while, uh, we need, uh, probably we need a couple of logs in the fire, uh, warm tea and so on, because we are old after all. <laughs> <laughs> so, Well, this green screen technology can do a lot of things. <laughs> 
Yes, but on on the on the other hand, uh, let's talk about the event itself. Yeah. Because uh, the thing that I wanted to see and the thing that uh, okay, the event itself was uh, advertised as both game jam, and having John Romero as a Doom guy, but the thing that uh connected those two things was education mm-hmm. and what i was asking in the, when i was talking to uh, john was uh, i was talking to uh, to him about what it takes to educate somebody to be able to create games mm-hmm. and uh the thing that i'm going to uh, mention before we uh, play the interview is going to be that i was surprised when he um uh, was talking about uh, having to uh, hyper-specialize. And this is one of those things where European style of education and American style of education completely uh, are, are completely different. Yep. Here, what we are doing is we are uh, moving uh, towards uh, trying to create a complete uh, engine, let's call it engineer, a person who is able to create the game by himself but he needs to know physics, uh, mathematics, uh, programming languages, um, uh, I don't know, uh, graphics, audio, and so on, and so on, and so on. And then we more or less overdo it in width, and then we create a shallow, uh, uh, shallow amount, uh, uh, a shallow pool of knowledge that they can pull from when they're trying to create a game. He's a proponent of somebody who is hyper-specialized. So, for example, he said that if the, uh, you want to create a, a gaming programmer, you are trying to create a coder, and he needs to know all the languages that are used today in the coding computer games. Okay. But he doesn't need to know anything about graphics. Mm-hmm. And this is one of those things, because basically what he's say, uh, saying is that you need to uh, educate people to be hyper-specialized, and then let them uh, get all the different things that they need in order to create their own game uh, along the way. Hmm. So not waste time on formal education. Do the formal education in the things that they actually need, and then just uh, leave them on the market. And I think this is a, this is an interesting look uh, at uh, what education should, should look like. Because you don't usually, when you are trying to explain to somebody what he's going to learn at the university, at the high school or whatever he's going into, uh, you are trying to say you are going to be completely prepared for the for the industry that you are uh, learning for. Mm-hmm. And this one says, okay, I'm not going to prepare you for the entire industry. I'm going to give you enough um, information and enough knowledge to be able to work yourself in just part of the industry and then you need, you need to actually do a lot of learning afterwards. I don't think that the education that we are getting today is much different than that. And I don't think it's a bad thing, by the way. Uh, you learn a lot, but uh, the university is in no way going to shape you in one specific direction. Nor it should. All the, all, the, all, the universities, all the universities are trying to do it. No, 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 no. And no. this is one of the big, big uh, errors that they're doing. They're not. They are not. I, when I finished my the university, uh, I was a functional, less than engineer, while having a engineering diploma. I didn't know how to connect cables, or I wouldn't know if I didn't do it myself, for network or for power or for uh, whatever. I learned all of that on my own afterwards. It gave me a broad knowledge about everything: mathematics, physics, electrical engineering, computer science, whatever, so that I can pull, uh, let's say choose from a plate of different types of food and select what I like. I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing, but I understand the point that John was trying to make about uh, hyper-specialization. He's looking at it from his perspective. And I'm not necessarily certain that that's the only way to do this. Do this. Uh, there is nothing wrong in uh, teaching uh, people who do programming how to do the physics part and the mathematics part and whatnot, and then specializing them for something. Uh, do you remember the part where when we were talking to John and you got triggered by his uh, one of his comments about the seniors? I didn't get triggered. Yes, you, you got yourself a complete rant about the seniors, juniors and uh, what is happening today in the market. Uh, that wasn't me, that was your colleague. 
and I think it was I think it was you. This is the only thing that you that you actually mentioned. Uh, I know my colleague uh, also had the thing about uh, juniors, but you were also talking about how people uh, need to learn their way into becoming a functional part of the team, and nothing wrong there. I'm still I'm still uh, thinking about this because it when you see it and when we were talking it sounds like we are being elitist we're not and no no but i say uh, we are not being but it sounds like we are okay because what we are promoting is uh having uh, people junior uh having junior people being juniors in a team and not doing anything or not mentioning anything and not uh, meddling in any 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 uh, thing but just uh looking at things and learning mm -hmm. and this is one of those things that people uh, that we have around us uh are completely incapable of okay and this is also one of the things that i was talking to john with and he said that uh, this is something that he wants to uh accomplish and this, i think that this is one of the the hardest thing to me to do to create people who are willing to learn willing to take initiative when they need to or when they have to but also uh, people who understand when to take a step back and wait. Mm -hmm. Actually, I had a very long rant with our one of our students on the graduate level two weeks ago, to the date, two weeks ago today. Okay. Exactly on that topic, because uh, I was talking to our uh, two female students on the graduate program, and they were like, yeah, we have to learn so much. Uh, they weren't complaining, they were just mentioning the facts. One of them is from France, and she doesn't have the IT background, and she needed to do a project for IT security, so it was quite difficult for her. And I told her, you know, some of the basic stuff that she either knows or feels or will learn with time. I just wanted to make the path a little bit shorter. Stop reading in diagonal terms, read left, right, stuff like that. We talked about that many, many times. But more to the point... I tried to explain to them that one of the fundamental mistakes that uh, young people make when they're trying to learn is that they're constantly trying to speed up, which is exactly the opposite of uh, what should uh, should be done. You should actually feel comfortable that you don't know something and not lose or sleep over that because that's the starting point of uh, starting point from which you can actually learn something. And after that, you need to go slow. And this is the mistake that a lot of people, uh, a lot of young people do. They try to speed up through the process and never gain uh, any kind of permanent value from the stuff that they, uh, that, that is good for them to learn when in college yes. and in life in general. Yes, I think that uh, what, uh, I think this is the direct, uh, direct result of uh what the uh, community or the society in general is trying to uh, push as the ideal of learning. Mm -hmm. They are trying to push all the people to finish the university. So they are trying to make a speed run uh, through the uh, educational institutions without thinking about why they need it. Uh, so they are... Uh, once they come to the university, they should be able or they should be prepared to start learning the skills that they need for the rest of their lives. Mm -hmm. And some of them, instead of instead of it, they are just trying to speed run to the university because they want to finish it. Mm -hmm. They don't make any concessions uh, in order to learn something. They're just trying to just finish all the subjects, get the graduation done, and that's it. Mm -hmm. And then... Once they are on the market, they start, they start to realize, okay, wait, I needed this thing that I had, uh, that I could have learned at the university, but they just went through it. Yeah. And this, this is the thing that I don't know if it's um, endemic for uh, our part of the world, or is it glo a global thing? It's a global but sometimes, thing. But I sometimes I think that people are just trying to uh, overdo the uh, formal part of the edu education just by not paying any attention and just thinking all the boxes. A, B, laser beam. I told you that yes. story many, many times over. And I still think it's a mistake. Yes, I know. I know. And uh, the thing is that uh, you are not only making a mistake, but you're also making a five-year mistake. 
Yeah, because and the stuff is... that you could have learned, you're going to have to relearn afterwards, and it's going to be more difficult. Yes, because you are going to uh, a get older, and b b you are going to waste in an enormous amount of time trying to learn things that you actually don't need. Mm -hmm. For example, uh, quantum mechanics for the for our field is a little bit uh, out of the out of our leagues. No, and yet we have to learn quantum it. computing is coming. We need that. Yes. Okay, you do that. I'm going to just uh, sit and wait. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, I just want to uh, finish this part of the this part of the podcast, uh, and let the let the rest of it be the pre-recorded uh, uh, interview that we have. Uh, the only thing that I also talked about, and I want to hear your uh, uh, your feelings about, because this is just the feelings things. It's not that we can change something. Is do you think that the games today have become less? Uh, I wouldn't say intelligent, but less uh, innovative. Uh, are you seeing, from your uh, perspective? Are you seeing uh, less of the games that are creative and the more of the uh, less of the games that are creative and the more of the games that are just repetitive things like I don't know Call of Duty or Medal of Honor, whatever? Yeah, and in multiple different ways. Uh, I mean, bec uh, just because I'm not gaming doesn't mean that I'm not noticing the games all around me. So yeah, I uh, I would say that a part of the problem is the regular law of diminishing returns. Because we had forty years of forty five years of game development, and it's not like you're going to invent a new type of game out of thin air after forty five years of different types of developments and different types of these games that have been already invented. So that's the law of diminishing returns part. Second part, most definitely, a lot of people are way more creative than education allows them to be which means that their creativity long-term is hindered by lack of education in the field of their creativeness, which uh, at the end of the day means that a part of that definitely reflects on the games. In translation, they are, uh, the games are most definitely less creative than what, it used to be, what they used to be. Yeah, that, that's, that's at least my thought process and my gut feeling. Because what I see on the market is that once you step a little bit away from the mainstream, mm -hmm. suddenly you realize that uh, the gaming has become enormously more creative. Really? Uh, yes, but on the other hand, uh, immense amount of these games fail. And this is this is the thing that um, I think that the, the gaming industry is one of the most used to failing from all the industries that I know. If we had this failure rate in any other industry, uh, I think people would com completely give up and just say, okay, this mm -hmm. is not the thing. And I think that the only thing comparable to games is the other art forms, uh, such as movies. Uh, Music uh, television, well. uh, uh, Television, but experimental television, not uh, mainstream television. And that's it. And it's probably the movies are the closest things to a game. Because you can be an indie film, a movie maker, you can create your own, I don't know, a movie or two because you have the drive to, to create something and then go on and uh, create i don't know stupid soap operas because you have to live uh, live and you have to make your uh, make make your salary mm -hmm. and this is what happens in gaming uh people come to the market create a game because they want to and then they go on and become a successful i don't know level designer uh, with a huge company and just do the slave work from the day to day uh, designing something this this that's a part of the bigger game and here's my problem with your last sentence i'm not pointing that sentence uh, or my problem directly at you it's the structure of the sentence that i'm heavily annoyed by uh, not because you said it but because i have recent experience with something similar actually from the past couple of days so, as as you know, I'm in the studio. I'm uh, doing some production work for finishing up my my first album, and my the friend that I do this with, so he is a mixing engineer. I'm producing, has another colleague uh, that's doing some work for him. They do a lot of voiceover uh, stuff for the movies, for the series, especially for cartoons. And yes. uh, the the guy that comes there and does the uh, work on the cartoons right now, at least this week and uh, last week. 
he's way younger than we are, at least 20 years younger. So he's still in, in his 20s, I'd say. And yesterday he, <coughs> yes, <coughs> yesterday he started complaining. <coughs> What's up? Uh, <coughs> I think I'm. Uh, I think I'm, I'm allergic to uh, people complaining. Yeah, sure. Yeah, you you being their ringleader. Yes. <laughs> Actually, he was complaining. You should see how this looks when you have to do five cartoons in a row. He's doing, basically, uh, he has pre-recorded voiceovers and uh, the SFX and the music and everything for Scooby in one of the local languages and he needs to do a video monta- video editing video montage of that so stops basically okay ba- basically he's looking at Scooby Doo for hours on on end and I was like you don't even know what work is dude if I if I could switch my place with you and do the stuff that you do I would be perfectly happy because that's so much fun and yes, uh, but- I also t- talked to him about our let's say yours and mine experiences of doing video editing for, you know recording video for classes intros outros you know the the transitions the the audio editing part the export the this the that and I told him I have like thousands of hours of work in that so yeah I know the process and uh, he didn't know that so it it ended up being a funny funny situation we had a good laugh about that but actually that that's one of the things a lot of the times people do not realize how rewarding it is to work in these sorts of creative industries the work is way less stressful than many other types of work i mean uh, compare that to an oil rig worker or something like that there is no comparison and i know i'm being stupid with that comparison but still and at the end of the day uh, the lack of creativity that we are uh, that i was uh, talking about earlier is a sign of a larger symptom in our society, which is that a lot of these creative types of work have been uh, heavily left behind by the money and uh, and generally speaking is just about uh, money, let's say. Let's uh, stop there. And the fact of the matter is without these creative industries, gaming being a part of that as well, a huge, a huge part of it, uh, I don't think that there can be a lot of you know societal progress. That's my opinion. Yes, this is one of those things because you have to have people uh, who are extremely intelligent, extremely uh, creative. They need to create stuff and they need to be able to make mistakes. Mm -hmm. They need to be able to make uh, enormous amounts of mistakes because they're going to do it because uh, there is no universal truth when it comes to art. And you need to pay them so they can actually live. Yeah, there you go, copy-pasting yourself from our first, second, third, fourth episode. We discussed this. I, I'm completely with you. You're yes. correct. And th- this is this is the thing. This is the thing that we have a problem with. And probably this is the reason why uh, the industry itself, uh, when it comes to gaming, is not as fun as it could be. Mm-hmm. But on the other hand, as, I said, uh, as you said, it's all about the money. So... Uh, having said all that, uh, let's uh, go into the studio uh, for a short interview with John. And uh, this has been that uh, IT show uh, for this week. We're going to see you next week, unfortunately, with much less fanfare and uh, pomp. And we are going to just be the... Uh, the the poor uh, two of us uh, do, doing another thing, and I think that I am prepared to um, announce because I need to do the pre-announcing in order to make Marcel finish it. Mm-hmm. I think that we are going to do the six five zero two second episode and try to talk about what six five zero two means for me and what it means to uh, for learning education in general, because uh, you don't know that. On the fringes of talking about games, I was talking to a lot of people uh, what we are doing. And when I mentioned 6002, I had quite a few uh, different uh, and very very interesting uh, conversations with people. Why do we do it? Mm -hmm. Because, for example, uh, one of my colleagues is completely up for uh, making people learn uh, Intel's uh, x86 uh, assembly first. He said that this should be done. And I said that he's completely insane, basically. Yes, I agree with you. He is completely insane. And you can call him in an episode. I'm, I'm going to tell that straight to his face. Yes, he, he does have a problem with this because he's he has been living in uh, X86 and then uh, 64 assembly for the last 30 years or so. 
and he is what he is. He's just a guy who doing the assembly. Maybe in the next couple of years he's going to start learning ARM assembly. Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> now, let's go to the uh, interview with John and uh, see you next week. Yeah, bye. Thank you, bye. But you can leave here uh, any, any, at any moment. But but and I'm amazed how much energy do you have. How do you... Uh, let's start the podcast. Why do keep we, on we making have, games? We have... No, <laughs> no. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the games. I need to talk to you about education. Okay. I need to talk to you Good. about uh, how do you motivate and educate people to do the games. How to start. Mm -hmm. Because yesterday when we were talking uh, completely off the record, the thing was that you mentioned that you would prefer always to have seniors. How do you, <laughs> how do you cre uh, cre uh, prepare competent juniors? Uh, well, you find juniors that are talented. You find people who can learn fast, right? It's, it's the, like they pick up what you're telling them to do. Um, and that they are eager to learn. They have to be eager to learn. They have to be smart enough to retain the information and execute the, the things that you're telling them to do. And then what you do is you get those juniors around, seniors basically all the time. And then they will pick up everything that the seniors are doing. And the seniors will be teaching them these little snippets of pieces of information constantly for all of these things that they had to learn in the hard way <laughs> over decades. Okay, hopefully. The juniors are picking it up immediately and understanding that from what they're learning and what they're hearing, what they're learning from hands-on and what they're hearing from seniors and how those things are reconciled and how oh, he told me this and I doing this, I need to take that idea and do it here because that's the way it's going to end up bad if I don't do it that way. And so really like juniors that are serious about getting good are the ones that will listen and they will do exactly what they're, what they're told and it will come out great because the seniors have done this a million times. They know how it's gonna work. And so the junior learns by listening to the seniors and executing what they are told to do. If they just do whatever they want, then they're not gonna learn. I mean, they'll learn the hard way. They'll, they'll learn things probably that they didn't wanna learn, but. <laughs> yes, but the, the thing is that uh, you want to stop juniors from uh, getting into the way the game is flowing basically because in order to create a game as we were talking with uh, Davar, uh, in order to create a game you need to be in it you yeah. need to be in the flow of the game because you need to understand the game and integrate. great so yeah. you need basically have the juniors that are going to be both observers and execution or slash operators that are going to do the things that they need to do without interrupting the flow of the team that that's the thing that i i'm, I'm completely failing how to, to understand how to motivate and create people that are able, able to do this you gotta let people make the gameplay right the thing that makes the game the game they need to be part of that because that's the thing that gets them all excited when they see something on the screen that they made and that thing is cool that makes them want to keep on doing it you know if they're always outside of that then they don't feel like they're effective and that they actually have a voice in the game or that they're doing what they wanted to do like what does everybody want to do when they're going to program a game they want to make the game happen, right? They don't want to like, some Some people might be like, I just want the right tools for people to use to make the okay. game, right? Some people might be like that, but the people that usually get into games want to make the game happen. And the more you can get them on the core, if they can be in the core loop developing that thing, then they're in the game, they're in the flow, they're making it happen. And you can switch people out and get new people in the core and learning about the core and they can all learn how the game's heartbeat works right? so basically what you're doing you are creating a reactor and then you are uh, radiating to people and creating <laughs> new exactly uh, <laughs> basic new isotopes that are going to create other games yeah because they need you're to be in the center them. you're yeah. charging them you're, you're, you're giving electrons to them yeah they go in there and they circle it and then they can come out right so they're part of that system yes the other thing is uh during the talk you mentioned driven to ship yeah uh, is it better to be driven to ship when creating the games or being driven to build? 
Because a lot of people are sometimes uh, get stuck in the building loop. They decide that the game is not perfect enough. Their game is not going to succeed. And then they break all the possible uh, deadlines and then suddenly they create the problems on themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, is it better to be uh, driven to build or driven to ship? And where, 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 is, where is the where, where is the where is the border? Well, uh, between those two? the funny thing is that like that kind of thinking, the perfectionist thinking, where it's not good enough to release, was only really valid until <laughs> you know the late '90s, maybe, where people were not online. There wasn't an online, and games when you shipped them, that was it. That was the end of. There were no updates. Like you put a game out, and that was it. It's on the cartridge. It was in the cartridge, yes. Right. Yes, it's on the yes. cartridge. It's on some kind of media. Or even back in the days of, of Doom, when we when somebody got the game, for a lot of people, that was it. They didn't. You had to hunt for patches. You yes, because get, they they got the disc. Or they're the, not fed. The, 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 this this copy, and that was it. Yeah. Or the, the, you you didn't you weren't told by the software that there was a new version of Doom. You had to hear about it or go looking for it to see if one existed. And if you never did that, you would not know that there was a Doom 1.2. And there, right? there wasn't a public idea of there a possibility of being there, there being a patch. So nobody was expecting that yeah. you, are, you are going to uh, publish a patch because you didn't. Nobody was talking about patches. <laughs> we didn't put the, press releases out for patches, right? That's one thing. And the other thing yeah. that nobody understood what the patch was actually was. Yeah. You just created another version of the game and then suddenly you realized, okay, I'm running Doom, whatever. Mm -hmm. And then this is uh, 0 0.1 uh, larger version than the one that I was running before. <laughs> and why is this? So, so this comes back to the like perfectionist thought. Like, why are you not releasing the game? Driven to build, driven to ship. <laughs> And the thing is, nowadays with digital distribution and games being expanded, deal DLC, etc., you need to ship, ship yes, your game. Know. You can deliver the next piece of it anytime you want. Like there is a date when you should set that your game comes out. You have a whole bunch of stuff to put in there. When you see that things are slipping, you rescope your game. You take the pieces out yes. that can be post-launch. Been there, but you launch. Right? Yes, you launch and then you <laughs> hope that the patch zero is going to be as small as possible and it's not going to involve a lot of people. Yeah, it's not the size of the game. <laughs> uh, <laughs> patch hopefully, zero, hopefully. it's the entire game again. <laughs> yes, the entire game again. Uh, but, uh, okay, we have seen that in the operating systems uh, theater. Yeah. I have seen patches that Microsoft did that the entire installation was ba basically inside the patch. Yeah, so, there's games like that. Yes, I know, I know, I know. Because <laughs> this is one of those things that you cannot, uh, sometimes you cannot fight against because you are rescoping so many things that at the same time, you are basically redesigning part of the flow of the game or part of the gameplay or whatever, yeah. and then trying to and then trying to keep up with the game itself once you uh, post-release or once, once you ship. Um, the other thing that I always want to ask somebody who is deep inside the, the industry, are we going, we're going to see the end of the endless IP series, the endless, uh, I'm not going to mention any names, but the endless iterations of the same game that makes money and then they create another game that is basically the same then it makes more money and then this against release of basically fun indie fun triple a but fun games that are different well the only reason why they keep on doing that is because people buy it yes you know the money, the money. <laughs> Right? Well, people want it. It's the source. Right? Yeah, they want it. They want the next FIFA, right? They want the next Madden. Um, and so people are buying it. That says, hey, we should make more of that for them, right? It doesn't stop indies from making games. This school's graduating how many more people? Every single cohort yes. into the world to make more shit, right? They're going to make more games. There's more games to be made. It's not like we are now making Madden again, like stack that person onto the Madden team. Like these people are going out and they're probably going to make their own stuff. And these are new games, brand new things that did not belong to a corporate entity trying to monetize a property that's been around for 20 years. It's people trying to make brand new stuff. And so this is not the only university. There's hundreds of them graduating floods of people out into the world to make new things but i have a right? feeling that uh, big uh, ips and big uh, basically games that have uh, budgets for marketing bigger than the budgets of the games themselves <laughs> are just choking the uh, ideas uh, when young people uh, feel like they are going to be for example I, i'm going to just uh, uh, do a soft drink uh, comparison yeah. so you want to launch a soft drink you're going to be stamped upon by corporations. Uh, those kind of feelings are some of the feelings that I have saw, uh, seen in the students that we had who are afraid to go to the market. They are afraid to ship 
because they think that e either the idea is not worthy or that they're going to be trumped on the market. So there is no way that they're going to succeed. So they don't even try. How do you stop this? How do you make people believe in their own games? Well, first of all, um, not everybody who learns how to make games is a game designer. So if they're a programmer and they want to program games, if they have no ideas for games, no problem. There are so many teams out there that need coders who do not have ideas about games. They know how to code and they need those people, right? They don't need a programmer coming on the team trying to change the design of the game. They need a coder to take the design that's already there and make it happen. So programmers and artists, they don't need to have the game design. They just need to have the technical expertise and the knowledge and the creativity to do the job that they learned how to do. The game designers are the ones <laughs> that are in the tough they, they spot. Need, they, need, they, need right? to, they need to be creative. And the other thing need to be basically needs to be part of the industry, part of the, uh, let's call it assembly line. So they are just basically assembly line workers, they're tools. But on the other hand, they need to be uh, enabled to uh, contribute Mm -hmm. As of as if to feel that they are part of the game. Yeah, absolutely. otherwise they are not motivated now because people don't understand how tough the industry is. Yeah, uh, people don't understand that. Uh, I'm always using the example of Rovio. Uh, Angry Angry Birds was what what 57th game that it made. Yeah. So yeah. basically, uh, everybody is talking about the 57th game, and they made more games after that. that yes, you but, don't know about. <laughs> but 56 before that, nobody knows about. And people, when they see the, it's a survival bias. You see the big guys, but you don't see the amazing work that the that indie studios do. and the indie studios that are uh, pushing out. Uh, we were talking about uh, TIS one thousand. We are talking about mm -hmm. uh, different games that are amazing. Yeah, but they are not getting the spotlight because the uh, uh, indie developer who is doing the game doesn't have that that amount of uh, that amount of uh, uh, marketing, or he doesn't have any marketing at all. They don't need marketing. That's the thing. Yes, this is if this the game is great. It will get out because right? they, they don't they, need to market. This it, is probably the best. They're on Steam. Yes, right? they're on Steam. And this this is one That's of great. those things because uh, as soon as we mentioned the same game, we played it, and there weren't any there weren't any marketing involved. Yeah, this game is actually yeah. one of those games. Yeah, that how are you, you gonna know? <laughs> you you actually it's played a super technical two. game. <laughs> yes, uh, the same with Factorio or whatever. Yeah, the, Factorio the, exactly. Yes, because it's 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 a game or uh, State State the Valley. Yeah. They're always, they're always using Stardew Valley for some reason. But Stardew is amazing, yeah. Yes. It's and, a great story, too. And it's still it's still running. It, it, they're able to... They. Um, him, the, he yeah. is able to provide for himself and make yeah. the game for, the, what, 15 years? Yeah, I've known, I've known uh, people who is like, a, say, a husband and wife team yes. that has been making games for 30 years for a for a, a, a group of, of players that loves the, what they do. They make RPGs, so it's called Spiderweb Software, and they've been making games since the 80s together, and they survive off of it, you know, and because they have a following, it just keeps getting bigger. We are in Croatia, I have, <laughs> I, I have a tough job imagining that, because I have seen that the problem is that uh, it's tough to see uh, different things happening at scale because there is no scale here. But mm -hmm. I understand. I understand. But once you have the uh, opportunity to go to the market, the market is huge. You're going to get the small chunk of the market, but mm -hmm. this is going to be a viable model. The last thing, what do you need to teach people to create games? Uh, uh, you uh, helped design a university uh, back in the States. Mm -hmm. How do you model a, a learning scheme that is going, is going to enable people to uh, create games? Well, it depends on what they're going to learn, right? If you're, if you're teaching programmers, you have to teach them everything about modern day programming in game in the game development. The tools, the techniques, the languages, you got to teach them all of that stuff as much as you can, right? And with artists, you have to teach them in a modern 3D game, here's all the tools. This is where it's going. Learn these things uh, and get a lot of practice and start getting good at making those models and, and the skinning and the rigging and the animation and all of those things. Like you have to learn the basics of that craft first. Um, and and with game design, you have to teach them about game mechanics and, and GDDs and you have to teach them about, um, you know, what is a good idea and how to take games that have already designed something similar and have had millions of players go through it, that that idea works. So, but basically right? you are talking about <laughs> hyper-specialized teaching for different roles in the gaming, yeah. uh, gaming design and then uh, trying to get people fit and 
probably get the rest of it along the, along the, along the way. Because I don't, I don't see any other way when you say they need to teach all of the languages that are used in game design. This by itself is three years or four, year, four yeah, years yeah. of uh, teaching. Yeah. And you have a you, you have to have a uh, person who is going to t no, uh, learn during today, <laughs> uh, uh, work during the night, and then create his own game during the night, and then uh, rinse and repeat <laughs> all the time yeah. in order to succeed. And this is okay because every every time when I'm talking, when I see any university, they're trying to create a whole a curriculum that is going to cover everything from physics yeah, uh, to mathematics to not going to work yeah and you are talking about hyper -special, specialized basically yeah and uh, the reason the reason for that is because the edge the leading edge of game dev just keeps pushing forward and if you're just always teaching the very basics how do they even get to the edge how do they even know where the edge is right it's like it's like normal learning in science right how do the the leading edge of physics is so far beyond anything that is taught in university, right? How do you get there when every day the leading edge of humanity's knowledge keeps going beyond anything that anyone's going to get close to, right? You have to get them through a lot of that stuff faster to get to the part that's interesting. Otherwise, they're not going to get interested. They're going to leave, right? So you got to get them excited, and they have to get to a point where they know how to learn on their own and where where it's going and then teach them like here's where we're at in physics this is the edge of what we understand in in quantum mechanics and quantum memory systems and quantum computing and how we're building ships and how everything is changing memristors you name it all the cool new technologies you got to get people to be curious about that stuff and know where the edge is and where we're at on on the future of what we're doing and point them over there. Like you want to be there, but you need to understand all of this stuff before you can understand that stuff. Those steps need to be followed, yes. right? Thank you. Uh, they're warning me. Okay. Because they're learning. <laughs> know, look down go. there is warning me that this is the last. This is the last time you have. All right. Uh, you have. Been, this has been an amazing couple of days. Thank you. And, uh, uh, meeting you. Uh, thank you, and uh, keep being a ball of energy.